Today we are looking at 1850s outfit for summer or spring for a more affluent woman um, with a very fashionable tiered skirt and I hope you enjoy that seeing what is hiding all, the, all that fabric here there's loads of volume but not a lot of weight to it and quite a lot of sewing <laughs> so let's have a go Needless to say, we are starting from the undergarments. A linen chemise, quite plain and a little bit old fashioned to be honest. With a flap that goes with a corset. And I already have my pantaloons. And let me see if you can see it. Cotton stockings and lovely laced boots from American Duchess. Right, let's start with a corset. Um, it is made to the original pattern from Atelier Silf and you've, you've possibly seen the cotton version of it in a 47 video and the lower class video. This one is basically the same pattern, uh, similar techniques but it is made in silk and couture so the outer layer is nice silk satin. It is flossed where the gussets are inserted to prevent from tearing. It has a few bones, one, two, three, four, I think, but most of the strength relies on cording, which gives quite a lot of um, flexibility and comfort. So we'll see how we get on with this one. The original has straps, but I find the straps a real pain. It doesn't really help much of anything. So this one is designed without the straps. It also has an original antique busk. As you can see, the busk here has three studs on one side and a stop on the other one to prevent opening. The corsets in the 50s are still relatively short, mostly because you wear big skirts, so you can't really see the outline of the hip. So controlling the hip wasn't really much of an issue. Um, whereas you have longer corsets coming up in the 17th, once the cuirass bodice comes into force and you definitely do want to see the hip. <laughs> but these ones are short and flexible and actually quite nice. So that's a nice bit. There is a video of this corset um, being made in a, in a day, so you might want to have a look at that, how it's been created. Anyway. We're wearing crinoline today, so that's a patent from late 50s, 56, I think the first one. You still wear sort of modesty petticoat underneath, just in case it flips over, you never know. And then crinoline on top of that. It's made with metal, it's 11 millilitres metal bit, and grotline ribbon. 11 millilitres metal bit, and grotline ribbon. And it for some reason doesn't want to. Ah, there we go.
So that's the cage. Look at the different colors here. You can see um, how you can actually move in that quite easily in the moving in the crinoline video. But it's all collapses nicely, so you can sit, you can go to the narrow bits. It just gives a little bit more shape. It's not much of a hazard in anything. A petticoat on top, you would have one or two petticoats, maybe more, but the great advantage of the cage was you actually could limit the amount of petticoats you were wearing. Uh, so it's much, much lighter than wearing um, corded petticoats and, and crin petticoats and loads and loads of layers before the cage was invented. corset cover, although you can have a little blouse as well. And again, corset covers prevent it and the damage to the bodice, but also soak it up the sweat. So quite useful little things. Not sure if I can do this one up though. The skirt is big. It also sports three flounces made in stripy taffeta. The base is just plain silk. Um, if you are a very affluent lady, you could actually have your flounces woven specifically to a shape and length and width you designed for a skirt. It was called woven à la disposition. Um, and then you would have different bits of fabric woven in a similar way to go for a bodice. Now, not everybody could afford that. I can't. So there was loads and loads of ways to make, uh, to achieve the similar effect of lots of layers and basically looking like a huge meringue. Um, using either stripy fabrics, so you can have lots of uh, flounces in stripy fabrics. Here, three, but it really depended on what pattern you had on the silk. You could have four, five, six, seven flounces, really up to, up to your heart's desire. The flounces started appearing in late 40s and usually two, one than two, but they really explode in the 50s. I mean, well, look at this, really explode in the 50s. Let me just put it on there. Um, you could also cheat creating the same effect with um, things like putting um, ribbons or, or fringes on the, on the plain skirt, just trying to get as many horizontal lines as possible in that instant. A little bit. It's all very light and it's very fluffy, but it has a lot, a lot of volume. And it's difficult to get it hang right with that and it helps and you got this focus. Jellyfish dress. That's better. Apart from this. The flounces could be finished with um, pinking like here. There you go. Pinking with the scissors. Um, or they could be bound. Or if woven, then the salvage is used. The pattern instructions for creating this dress are in my second book, the second Victorian dressmaker book. Oops. But yeah, fun. 
The bodice here is woven, like it's made in the same silk as the base of the skirt and it's decorated with bands of silk that are used for the, for the flounces. The ribbons are also made of the same silk so you really make use out of it as much as you can and additionally decorated in antique fringe, very very tiny little fringe. So lots of that. It is lightly boned. As you can see some boning. Closes with hooks and eyes. That's one bone, second bone. And it has dress shields into the armpits, preventing where soaking up the sweat. They're easily removable. Um, and it's made as one piece with skirt. It's slightly different than the croquet dress, I think. And I'm going cross eyed here trying to find them. Okay. Success. done. Bows galore, flounces galore. Now obviously you wouldn't have bare forearms. The open sleeves and a sleeve with lots of volume were very fashionable so you have quite tight upper arms but loose flounces here. Um, and for that in cooler months be wearing your false sleeves. These ones are in cotton organdy and they tie up or button up at the very end here and we have closure at the wrist. So it's decent, not flashing a lot of skirt, a lot of skin and you have quite a lot of volume filling up the sleeve. We'll discuss the winter ones, or sort of cooler weather ones later on. This one is made of matching silks by Sherry from Farthingale Historical Hats. And it just goes pretty easily here. So many bows. <laughs> If the summer evening is a little bit cool, you have your little pelerine. Again, matching silks. And this one closes with buttons in front so you can actually hide all those bows underneath and be a little bit plain. Or you can flash your bows, up to you. And a funny contraption, basically an equivalent of our sunscreen, was an ugly 
and ugly was an extra brim you would add to a hat to protect your delicate complexion from the sun. So that's what an ugly is. You basically put it over your original hat and it keeps your face in the shade. Not sure if ugly is a good word for it and it also falls flat if not in use, but I'm crazy aware. Um, they could have boning and, and usually wire. This one uses cane and uses four different canes. Quite cute actually, mm. not, not so ugly. Um, both the hat and the ugly instructions and pattern will be in my Victor and Dress Maker Companion book out this autumn. So hey, ugly on. Mm. Even better. <laughs> Cute. You haven't seen that phone then. Just put some gloves on and I'm ready to go out. For cooler months, um, you put more layers on. Um, yes, you can have dresses made in wool and sturdy silk, but obviously not everybody could afford so many dresses for different seasons. So you would work with how to make this dress work for spring or autumn as well. So first of all, you would change your sleeves into nice warm wool sleeves. Obviously you can wear um, much, much warmer petticoats and chemise as well, so that would help. Where is the from? There it is. But we have nice sleeves for the winter. And a mantle, a talma. This one is made in two layers of wool, so it will most definitely keep you quite cool. It's nice and cosy. And more options here. If you're not going out much, but you are cool around your household, you can wear a salty cap. that would provide you with a little bit more warmth and it's just a knitted wool cap with a little fringe at the back that stays nicely here and that's quite cute actually not sure how warm that would be in the proper winter but it looks really cute um, additionally you can have a rigoletto. Again, it's this knitted and much warmer headdress with lots of pom-poms. Let us try it on. I think it's a younger woman's <laughs> gear, but um, hey, <laughs> this is cute. Well, that will definitely keep your ears much, much warmer. That's funny. <laughs> it's the coronavirus cap because it looks like those little coronavirus representation. Mm. Oh. <laughs> oh, this is so funny. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed this. That's my coronavirus cap now. That's it. So <laughs> it doesn't have any other name. And um, if you want to support me, this the usual buy me a coffee account. I need to buy another one of these. These are brilliant. I haven't knitted these. I can't knit. I can crochet, but I cannot knit. Um, by a friend of mine. So cute. <laughs> See you next time, guys. Mm -hmm.